Um, so yes, thanks very much, Sandra, for that, that introduction. Um, and thanks to the GSA for the opportunity to uh, present some of the progress on our work today and uh, give you an inside look at uh, what the project is all about and the um, achievements that we've able, we've able to rack up thus far um, in terms of uh, what the project looks like, where it's going and everything in between. So um, I would like to acknowledge, you can see a few names there as well. This is absolutely not just my own work. There are a whole host of people that are contributing to the work you're going to see today. Um, uh, Lily Reed is the first name you can see there. Uh, Lily did a PhD in the Flinders Ranges um, on the Ediacan fauna, and she definitely keeps me honest in terms of uh, my core um, paleontological knowledge. So she's a, a huge asset to the team. Um, Justin, you can see there as well, um, supervisor Lily, and uh, is a colleague of mine here at UniSA um, who contributes to a lot of what you're going to see. Steve and Jack as well, um, who are part of the technical side of the team, uh, producing many of the, the visualizations that I'll be sharing with you today. So a whole range of different people involved um, that make, make this project possible and, and to the quality that you'll uh, get a chance to experience today. So just to give you a bit of a breakdown of um, today's uh, presentation. As Sandra said, I will spend a little bit of time just introducing Project Live, what it represents um, and how it ties in with what we're doing uh, within this particular Flinders project. Um, to give you a taste, I guess, of, of, of what it's all about as well, I'll show you some examples of our recent projects um, just by, by way of background. <laughs> and then we'll step straight into the Flinders Rangers project. Um, a bit of a behind the scenes look at exactly what we're doing, the motivation behind it, why we're doing it. Uh, what we hope to achieve, and then basically taking you through the different themes and structure of the virtual tour um, step by step, so you can see what we what we've already collected for the modules that are complete um, or close to, and what we're in, what we're aiming to complete within the next uh, little while. Um, and as, as Sandra said as well, there will be plenty of time, provided I don't rabble on for too long, uh, with questions and discussion at the end. And please feel free to populate the chat as we go through um, with any questions you might have. I'll, I'll keep an eye on it. Um, I'm happy to take questions as we go through and answer those if they're um, if they're along the lines of what we're talking about. Um, but equally, we can save it to the end and have a more involved discussion then. Okay, so Project Live, what is it? As, as Sandra mentioned, um, learning through immersive virtual environments is what the acronym stands for. It's an initiative that um, started at UniSA in 2014. So we've been going for about seven or eight years now. Um, and it actually has its origins in geoscience. So um, it's was designed to uh, create virtual field trips that are an authentic replica um, of what, what the experiences we take our students on in person. So um, I wanted to add value, I guess, to that learning experience that the students uh, take. It's such an intense um, uh, and time when you're in the field, particularly when you're, when you're starting out in geoscience, there's so much to take in, a flood of information, um, and you don't really get a chance to reflect on it too much without revisiting the site. So I thought, there was an advantage in virtually capturing classic field sites, both that we take our students to and those that we, that we don't have the opportunity to take our students to for all sorts of reasons, whether they're logistical or financial, for example, um, and really get the most out of that experience. Allow our students to reflect on it, to revisit it, and even hopefully um, do some reconnaissance, although that, that might be slightly more rare than we'd hope. Um, so that's where it started, creating authentic replicas of, um, of our field trips that we take our students on. Um, and that's kind of grown and grown and grown into a whole range of different areas. Um, so now Project Live encompasses all of STEM, essentially, and many things beyond that as well. So, um, oh, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll show you some examples of um, some of the uh, projects and so on that we've been involved with in a little while. Um, but I should also, before I get to that, <laughs> um, I'll um, mention as well that Project Live sits um, in parallel to uh, the Australian Research Centre for Interactive and Virtual Environments, which is based here at UniSA as well. So I'm a member of IVE and the director of Project LIVE, and the two go very much hand in hand. So IVE is, a, is actually the largest uh, concentration of virtual and augmented reality researchers in the Southern Hemisphere. It's well over 100 people um, working in this space in all sorts of innovative areas. Um, and an example of where this has bled over into the research side is uh, what you can see there is some geological survey staff um, at the Tonsley Core Library um, using a, an augmented reality logging tool that we're developing as part of the MinEx CRC, something that's driven via a tablet interface or also equally by 
the, the HoloLens goggles that you can see there in the lower right hand corner. So we work in both the teaching and outreach space, but equally we work in the research space, applying virtual reality and, and augmented reality to all sorts of different problems um, to come up with creative solutions of ways to visualize things in a different way effectively. So in terms of our projects, I'll just actually load up um, this web page to give you a sense of what it looks like. Just let me um, just let me share that screen. Yes, okay, so this is the projects um, page on our website. Well, you get a bit of a, a cross section, I suppose, of the various different um, areas that we've been working in. So the 360 Flinders Ranges is the one I'm going to be unpacking today. But some of the other ones that you may have heard about a little bit, I guess, is the Facing Fire project, which looks at uh, simulations of bushfire evacuation scenarios, for example, training people to be better prepared for those events. Um, we've done virtual art galleries that you can see there. Uh, that, well, Bloom exhibit is what our um, graduate students um, uh, in art and design here at UniSA produced last year during the pandemic, um, a virtual exhibition of their works because we couldn't get to campus uh, to visualize it. Um, there is also one on the Adelaide Treasury, for example, which is a, a virtual exploration of the tunnels underground the Adelaide Treasury, and it sort of weaves that into a narrative about, um, about the evolution of financial systems globally, and particularly in South Australia as well. And there are a bunch of others, and these are some that may particularly be of interest to GSA members. There are a bunch of additional virtual resources for some of the, um, some of the GSA brochures, for example, like the one on uh, the North Terrace Building Stones that Barry Cooper and, and several others were involved with. We have produced a virtual equivalent, I guess, of that experience where our students, because they, they do do this as part of one of their um, expeditions, go along North Terrace looking at the building and dimension stones there. And we've got a fully virtual uh, recreation of that experience. Uh, again, something that we had to produce uh, last year during the height of, height of COVID, um, but it's now freely available for all of uh, the GSA or anyone else to access and, and explore. Um, and there are a bunch of other galleries as well from the SA Museum. So uh, the fossil galleries, um, the, the, both the Ediacaran and the Cambrian galleries are uh, provided uh, um, on our site as interactive virtual tours that you can experience. Um, so there's a bunch of stuff there that um, is all freely available and uh, hopefully gives um, some of the members of the GSA and others um, something to explore. Um, equally, I might just show you quickly, because I know Pat's here, so he'd, uh, he'd kill me if I didn't show this. Um, is some uh, material connected to uh, Wichelina, um, which is an area that Pat has been working on very close, of course, to where we're gonna be exploring today in the Flinders, um, but a bunch of geo trails and other geotourism opportunities that exist there where we've developed uh, virtual tours to accompany them and a bunch of other brochures that we'll be adding to continuously. Pat's working in conjunction with the Nature Foundation that you can see there to produce uh, this content. So a bunch of other, geoscience and related projects um, that you can access freely via our website. Now, the one that I'll just show briefly is Beyond the Ice. Um, by way of introduction, I guess, to what we hope to achieve for the Flinders project. Um, so this is one uh, that is was developed for the Halicove Heritage Site, uh, which is just south of Adelaide. Um, one that's very well known for all its glacial features and modern landscape features as well. Um, so we've produced a virtual reality experience essentially for that, which we've called a geo challenge. And effectively it is, is a way to, for our students and the general public to explore this site, which has a whole range of different features in a very tight space. Um, a lot of different themes that can be unpacked and we deliver it via an immersive virtual experience um, that they can explore. Now it's available in a, in a sort of a, um, something you can drive with a headset, but equally it's also available as you'll see here, via a web-based geotour. So something that can just be simply accessed via a web browser. And that's what's, again, available via our Project Live webpage that you can see there, where people can explore this uh, with nothing more than just a standard laptop or desktop, as it may be. So I'll just, just to give you a sense of what the, what the Beyond the Ice project um, looks like. Yes, okay. So what I've got now is just a, a sort of a minute and a half video, I guess, that gives you an insight into what, uh, what this video looks like. Uh, sorry, what this virtual experience, the, the Geo Challenge looks like, and I guess uh, the parallels that it may have to what we're hoping to achieve for the Flinders Rangers. So I'll just let that video play now.
Okay, so what you saw, I guess, as you as you uh, as that video rolled, was just a few of the ways that we integrate immersive images of the environment with a bunch of interactions, I guess, whether that's finding fossils, whether with a digital hand lens, for example, using a compass, using digital ink, as you can see here, um, to draw some annotations on the fold and, and visualize the structure of some of the some of the classic um, portions of the shore platform that we have at Hallett Cove, conducting quizzes um, that sort of um, prompt people about some of the key details and interpretive information about the landscape, um, collecting some pet rocks, <laughs> which we did just as a bit of fun, um, where you can kind of uh, assemble your collection as you unlock different things along the path, um, a virtual um, landscape or representation of the entire Hallett Cove Conservation Park that you can see there, and a lab space which allows you to visualise things like the progressive geological history of Hallett Cove, um, and access some fly-throughs and various things of some of the key localities. And there's all sorts of other assets like videos and photos and, and whatnot that you can kind of build into the tour and give people the freedom to explore at their own pace. Um, Large-scale 3D reconstructions of the landscape as well, in this case, a drone model um, that allows people to fly through the landscape and see it from whatever point of view they'd like to. So these are the kind of basic elements, I guess, behind how Hallett Cove was made and the kind of experience like I said, our intention was to produce a fairly authentic representation of that field experience. And this hopefully gives you a sense of uh, what that could look like for something like the Flinders. So without further ado, then let's actually talk about the Flinders Ranges itself and what we're trying to do. Um, I wanna start with a bit of background about the motivation. Why are we actually doing this and what, what do we hope to achieve? And I think in, in a nutshell, um, it's we want to support world heritage um, and the nomination process itself. So um, if you've looked at the serial property statement, if you've looked at some of the initial documentation around uh, the Flinders case that's being built at the moment by the South Australian government, in particular, the Department of Environment and Water and the Department of Energy and Mining, um, it's a very dense document and it has to be. That's what the formal application requires. Um, but we want people to engage with that process. We want people to be able to have those words leap off the page and give them an understanding of exactly why the Flinders is being proposed as a World Heritage Site. What is its geoscientific significance? What is the values um, that we're placing on that landscape that make it so important? What's its cultural heritage, for example? Um, and what are all the different um, aspects to it that, that require some explanation in order for people to better understand exactly why this process is being undertaken? So that's what I mean by supporting the world heritage process, giving people an avenue to engage with it. Um, for us as geoscientists to communicate the reasons why we're doing it. And also, I guess, to, um, to provide a bunch of supplementary information as well that may or may not actually be able to make its way into the formal application itself. So we've, we've got the luxury of having total freedom. We can put whatever we like into this. We want it to obviously represent the world heritage nomination process but we do have the flexibility to bring in things that may not ultimately become part of the formal application um, and also um, can spin off into whatever other angles you may want to explore. So it's a resource, essentially, where we're creating a resource um, for the global community, because that's the other advantage of creating a virtual tour. It's not just restricted to those in our own backyard that can immediately access it. We want this to be something that has international reach and impact. So I guess another question that you, that you would be perfectly valid in asking is why are we using virtual reality? Why is that the mechanism um, or the platform that we want to use to, to create this kind of resource? And I guess my answer to that is that virtual reality is becoming very ingrained actually in the way that we provide these sort of immersive and interactive experiences for people, both in the geotourism space and in the teaching space and in the outreach space and so on. And the large driver for that is just how accessible they're becoming. So I've just given some examples there, I guess, of um, virtual reality platforms now that are very approachable. Um, so the Oculus Quest 2, that's a pretty standard headset that we use here at the University of South Australia and is used elsewhere. It doesn't have a requirement of needing a laptop and it's less than $500 and you get an excellent virtual reality experience. Um, it can also be tethered to a laptop as well if required. Um, for the higher end graphics experiences as well. So it gives you quite a, 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 an achievable entry point into the world of VR. But beyond that, there's an even cheaper solution, I guess, uh, with Google Cardboards and the like, where you simply place a mobile phone within a, within a headset um, shroud of some kind, and that allows you to use an existing device that you might have about 
um, uh, uh, to access this content. And so whilst we will have a dedicated VR experience for the Flinders project that we'll need a higher end headset to use, we will also have a lower tier um, uh, platform that can be accessed just on a web browser. So you could use it on your laptop or equally, you could fire it up on your phone and use something like a Google Cardboard to provide that immersive experience. Um, so that, that we are very conscious of making this accessible and open to everyone. Um, and that's just some of the ways that we're trying to achieve that goal. But accessibility and inclusion is actually another reason that I think the virtual reality experience is so important. Um, because as I said, we're gonna offer a range of different complementary varieties or platforms of this, both that require a headset or require a laptop or phone or something like that. Um, and that opens up a few different flavors of it, I guess, that tailor to different audiences and different cohorts of people, um, gives them the opportunity to access it <laughs> in a pretty approachable way. And also doesn't exclude those that will never be able to travel to the Flinders, or even if they could, could wouldn't be able to uh, see some of the key sites because of access issues um, to, to get there on the day. Or maybe you just have bad luck and it's awful weather, for example. So um, we wanna open this up to as broad a, uh, an audience as we can. And virtual reality gives us the power to do that um, internationally um, for all sorts of different groups of people. Okay, so moving on to the themes and structure. What are we actually going to do? And uh, how are we gonna structure this, this virtual experience? We have designed seven portals, um, as we've called them, that you can see there. So on the left-hand panel of that image, <laughs> you can see the subheadings um, and it encompasses everything across basically the 600 million year history of the Flinders that we have uh, recorded today and everything from the, the, the southern reaches of the Flinders all the way up to Ark Ruler as well. So covering a fairly broad footprint, as you can see, trying to triangulate the area um, as best as we can. What I'm going to do now is, this, is step you through each of these different subheadings you can see there to give you a sense of uh, what we hope to achieve and in some cases show you what we've already produced. So it'll be a bit of a mixed bag. Some of these we've worked up um, uh, uh, almost to completion, some of these portals, and we'll be releasing them progressively rather than waiting until the final thing is, is complete. And others we haven't started on yet. So it'll be a bit of a bit of a mixture of, of different levels of progress as we go. So let's start with the first one, faults, faults, and fossils. This is really a big picture view of the Flinders Ranges. Um, it's structural evolution, for example, it's, um, it's geomorphology, um, all of the classic landscape features that we fall in love with and, and, and what make the Flinders Ranges so unique um, and allow us to explain some of the key features like the stratigraphic um, details of the Flinders and how beautifully exposed that is, representing an entire cross-section of geological history and a, and a, and a way to access deep time. Um, some of the beautiful fold structures and fault and fault structures that are so well exposed at the large scale as well. So it gives us an entry point really to set the scene for a lot of the different events and geologic, uh, geologically significant features that are to follow. And the basis for that is actually what you can see here. This is a three-dimensional model of, um, in this case, this is a portion of the Flinders Ranges from Orpina Pound to uh, Brachina Gorge further north. Now this isn't footage, this is a model. This is produced by aerial imagery that we've um, used to create a digital elevation model and then draped with the ortho imagery um, to texture it to, to make it a lifelike representation of the Flinders. Okay, so this is this is something with this is literally hot off the press. Um, we've only we've only sort of finalized this in the last couple of weeks. And this is just a demonstration, I guess, of what's possible. But uh, in the virtual reality experience, you will be in control here. You will be able to fly through this landscape and see it from whatever perspective you like. We'll be draping the geological map and other interpretive features over the top of this model. So you'll be able to see, for example, the correlation between the topography and the geological features. You'll probably even be able to change the time of day. So you get to see it at sunset or sunrise as per your preference. Um, so this is just a bit of a teaser, I guess, of what that model looks like. It's, it's a little bit rough at the edges now because we haven't worked it into a complete environment. Uh, but you can see now some of the experimentation with different lighting effects and so on. Um, so yeah, this will be a completely um, interactive three-dimensional representation of the, the relief and the structure and the geomorphology of the Flinders from the air, where you've got, you, you've got total control over what you want to see and so on. Okay, now 
beyond just showing a 3D representation of the landscape as well, we wanted to show it as though you had what many of us wish we had the opportunity to do, uh, which is to take a chopper ride or a, or a light aircraft flight um, through a landscape like the Flanders and see it from the air. So we have produced um, a drone video. Basically, you can see the basics set up there where we hang a 360 degree camera off the bottom of a drone to give you a perspective that you've never seen before of the landscape. And what I'll show you now is actually a, a 360 degree video of Rawnsley Bluff, which is one of the classic sites um, at Wilpena Pound, um, where you get an insight into um, you know, what that the landscape looks like from the air. That, that, and what you can see now, it kind of looks like a conventional video, um, but it's not, it's a 360 degree video. So as I move it around, you can, you can see that the landscape from any perspective that you choose. So in a headset, for example, this would track your movement through the air and you'd be able to you know, turn around and look at the chase range if that's what you wanted to, or you'd be able to flip your perspective, look at some of the stratigraphy as you migrate towards, um, as you migrate towards uh, the entry into Wilpena Pound. The choice is yours. Essentially, you're in full control in terms of what parts of the landscape uh, that you want to investigate. And what I'll do is I'll just let it run because I know everyone's anticipating the entry into Wilpena Pound and it is quite spectacular. It looks even better in a headset. So you can see it, you know, you can, you can glance straight down the sheer cliffs, for example, and then rotate up to give you that perspective of Wilpena Pound as you rise over the crest um, and into the pound itself. Okay, so something that's um, something that, you know, you can't, you certainly can't get this close to the landscape in a chopper or a light aircraft very easily, but with the drone, uh, we can get very, um, very close to see the Flinders in all its glory and the Wilpena Pound especially. It's a stunning landscape that drones give us an, an amazing way um, to experience. So that's the beauty of 360 degree video, I guess, and this is extremely high resolution. It's 8K video. Um, so it really is beautifully sharp uh, in order for you to see it in all its glory. Um, that, that encapsulates all of the, the uh, structural evolution and geomorphology of the Flinders. Let's move on now to uh, the second portal, which is our ancient ancestors. Now, of course, this is probably the flagship of the, the World Heritage Bid, documenting the very geologically and internationally significant Ediac and fauna that we have beautifully preserved in the Flinders, many examples of which you do not find anywhere else uh, uh, globally. And what we want to achieve here, I guess, is a reconstruction of what that environment looked like at Ediacaran times. The way we've approached that is using um, uh, the paleo artist that you can see mentioned there, Katrina Kenny. Uh, Katrina is someone who has worked with, with paleontologists over a number of years, producing some amazing reconstructions of these otherworldly kind of critters that inhabited our earth uh, millions and millions of years ago. One that you may be familiar with is the Anomalocaris that graced the cover of nature. Uh, not so long ago, a beautiful depiction of what that uh, beastie used to look like. And she's also done a whole bunch of others. Uh, uh, Cambrian um, animals, for example, uh, at Emi Bay and Kangaroo Island and various other places. So beautiful representations of what these things used to look like. The one that you can see there, of course, is the Dickinsonian. Uh, one, of the, one of the classic uh, Ediacan fauna that exists in the Flinders. What we want to do, I guess, is take it beyond just um, the casts of these fossils that are preserved in the sedimentary rocks um, that we see throughout the flindos and actually bring them to life by animating them, putting them within, in, within an underwater scene and showing you exactly what that Ediacaran seafloor would have looked like. Now, I don't, wanna, I don't want to give too much away, but what I will show you some examples of what these, um, what these critters look like. So this is a demonstration of some of the, um, some of the fossils or some of the fauna that um, Katrina has modelled for us and then we've animated and produced in a VR environment. So you can see a range of different Ediacan fossils um, that are represented there across, you know, a pretty good cross section of what we see in the Flinders. Um, and each one is fully three-dimensional, able to be interacted with, able to be animated, and we will place in an underwater scene to enable you to swim with the Ediacans. I guess that's the concept, um, to give you a very tangible sense of what that environment looked like. And Again, this is not what the underwater environment will look like, but I guess it gives you a taste of once they're all animated, it really does bring them to life. They leap beyond just those casts that we have preserved in the rocks into, um, uh, into a pretty tangible representation of what that seafloor may have looked like. And that's what you can see there. 
So it'll be really exciting as that all comes together to give people a chance to um, embed themselves basically in Ediacan times at the bottom of the seafloor and see what that may have looked like. Okay, on to the next module, which is snowballs in the tropics, of course, referring to um, the snowball earth um, that is so well represented within um, the, um, uh, the stratigraphy of the Flinders Ranges. And we have this classic site, of course, the, the GSSP, the Golden Spike, which is preserved uh, in uh, Enorama Creek, where we have the, the transition between the Alatna Glacials and the Nakalina um, Cap Carbonate that represents the beginning of the Ediacaran period. Um, the first uh, Golden Spike established in the Southern Hemisphere and the first new geological period established within 120 years. So an extremely geologically significant um, site that we want to capture as part of this virtual tour. And this is it, basically. This is, this is just a conventional video, um, but this is one that we've also collected in 360 where you can move and approach towards the, um, the GSSP site, which is just in there, as, as many of you would know, um, and see that in 360. So you get to float up the creek, moving upwards through the stratigraphy as you approach um, that boundary layer between the Alatna and the Nakalina. Um, so, so showing you exactly the context to where that, uh, where that boundary is. And then moving beyond that to a three-dimensional reconstruction of that boundary itself. So again, this is not a movie. Um, this is a model. This is a three-dimensional uh, photogrammetry reconstruction of that boundary. You can see the GSSP, the golden spike just there. And um, a boundary that you can explore from any angle, essentially. Um, to show exactly what that very globally significant feature within the Flinders looks like um, and experience it for yourself as though you were there. Um, it shows all of that, the three dimensionality of that outcrop in great detail um, to take you right, right, you know, place you in the a box seat, I guess, to see what that looks like and also to preserve it um, for posterity as well in many ways in its current form. Okay, moving on then to cosmic collisions. Um, this, of course, is talking all about um, the Ackerman impact, that uh, globally significant event, again, that um, occurred at about 580 million years ago, where we had uh, the Ackerman meteorite um, uh, impact um, Air Peninsula in the middle of that, and the ejector fallout from that, uh, which has ultimately settled on, on the rock preserved within the Flinders Ranges. Um, so this is the kind of ejector horizon that many of you may have seen before, where we have fragments of the Gaula Ranges, uh, the granites and, and uh, dacites and so on that outcrop uh, throughout that region, which were uh, exploded into the atmosphere and then eventually rained down and are preserved in this extremely unique and unmistakable layer within uh, the siltstone that you can see there. And so what we have done, I guess, to show you what that looks like is capture some immersive imagery of the actual ejector layer as it's preserved in Bunyaroo Gorge. So you can have some 360 degree views to give you a sense of that. Um, and also it's broader context. So placing that specific layer within the overall stratigraphy. So this is an aerial shot immediately above that ejector layer where you can see some of the broader um, development of the stratigraphy leading up to that event and then immediately what followed. Unpacking that um, that evolution of layers, the, the, the representation of deep time that it, that it shows, and so on. There'll also be a 3D reconstruction of that layer, um, which we've produced, which I haven't got for you here today, um, but will be equivalent almost to what you saw for that, for that golden spike. Now, this is again a project that we are an element of the project that we haven't fully worked up yet, but we've been speaking to a number of people, several of which are here today actually, about representing the Ackerman side. So the Lake Ackerman. Uh, side of the story as well, a uh, reconstruction of that. So you get a sense of the connection, the spatial distance between Lake Ackerman and the impact site, sorry, the ejector site as well, um, and exactly the connection between those two landscapes. And hopefully, if, if time and budget allows, um, a reconstruction of that impact event as well. We'll see how we go, but that would be amazing if we were able to pull that off in virtual reality as well. Okay, so then now we'll move into a couple of the modules which we haven't uh, developed any resources for yet. Um, but the first of those is hot rocks, um, of course, at Arkarula, which is a very significant portion of the World Heritage Bib. Um, extremely well known, of course, um, um, by association um, with people like Spriggan Mawson, for example, and all of the 
very um, important discoveries they made about the geothermal system that exists uh, within uh, Arcarula itself, like at Paralana Hot Springs, for example, and also the hydrothermal and fluid rock interaction um, systems that are, that are beautifully preserved through that part of the world as well. So taking people to um, an experience of all of these classic things, as well as, of course, the extremely rugged topography that is classic Flinders, or in particular, classic Arcarula that we want to preserve as well. Um, another module, an extremely important part of the story as well, of course, is the cultural heritage of the Flinders. So this is where we will incorporate um, the Adamatnia perspective of the landscape and its development over time. We have uh, the huge advantage of um, working local, with the local community there, and in particular with the ranger in charge at, at uh, Wilpena Station, um, who's an Adamatnia man, um, Alan Harbour, um, who's also... By, by coincidence and, and uh, great fortune, a master's student at UniSA at, at the moment, supervised by Lily and Justin. And Alan's project is, is along the lines of exactly what we hope to achieve here, which is looking at the connection between traditional uh, Aboriginal interpretations of the landscape and our uh, modern scientific interpretations of it. So the alignment between those two and the differences between those two and how we can draw connections between the way that they have seen the landscape for thousands of years and how we are becoming to understand it as scientists um, through our lens as well. So we hope that they, that will create a really powerful demonstration of the commonalities between us, I guess, and the unique perspective that the local Aboriginal people have on, on this uh, very special part of, of, of country for them um, that we want to unpack according to what uh, they deem is most appropriate for us to share um, with a broader audience. So that would be a really exciting aspect to the tour as well. Now, finally, this is the last module that I want to, to show you. And this is one that we have worked up to a large extent, and that's focused on the mining heritage of the Flinders Rangers, the Copper Road, as you can see there. Um, unpacking, I guess, some of the early discoveries that were made um, in the Flinders Rangers, like the Blinman Mine that you can see there, which is now a heritage um, site for geotourism um, that we were able to access and capture, um, uh, all the way through to um, um, some of the ruins that are still preserved in other areas of the Flinders that I'll show you some examples of, like at Sliding Rock, uh, at Warrawina Conservation Park, for example. And using that, I guess, to build how some of the knowledge that was initially discovered in the Flinders um, with serendipity or otherwise, um, led to discoveries such as Olympic Dam, um, one of the, the largest uh, iron oxide copper de gold deposits in the world. So how the foundations of that, that struggle and the discoveries that were made in the Flinders ultimately paved the, paved the way um, to some of the deposits which we now rely on um, hugely for um, our raw materials that we that we use in, in for modern conveniences and various other things. So how do we do that? This is actually, again, this is not a video. This is a model. This is a laser scan of the Blinman Heritage Mine that we've captured and that we will um, as you'll see in a second, we have turned into an immersive underground mine experience where you're able to walk through the mine and experience it um, as though you were there. So um, something that's made possible through the, the, um, the clever technology of a laser scan, capturing all angles and all aspects of this underground mine so that you can then migrate through it um, and, uh, and see it for yourself in virtual reality. And what you'll also see in a video demonstration that I'll show in a sec is some of these ruins that are still preserved, such as at the Sliding Rock Mine, which you can see there, a beautiful example of where some of the original mine workings are still in place and in, in very good nick. Um, so you can see, for example, at that aerial view, you can see several of the chimneys and the old uh, operations. There's even the hotel and the shop of the early settlement that's still preserved there. Um, so a great way to, to see the legacy, I guess, of some of these sites. This the uh, the reason that we selected Sliding Rock, I guess, partly was because of how well-preserved it is, but equally actually because we take our third year students there at UniSA, they actually look at some of the legacy issues of the mine itself, um, the contamination of the soil and landscape, um, and uh, the remediation efforts that have been put in place to manage that both at Sliding Rock and elsewhere. So that's actually their third year um, camp experience. And we thought, why not? We'll tag along and capture it. And, and it's a great representation, I guess, of some of those early copper discoveries and how they're preserved and give an insight, I guess, into what, uh, what life was like back in the 1800s um, when, these early, um, when these early mining discoveries were being made. 
So what I'll show you now, I guess, is what, how all of these elements have been brought together to give you a, a taste of what that mining heritage portal looks like. And as we go through that, just for a bit of fun, we also strapped our 360 camera to our four-wheel drive um, as you work, uh, as we worked out through Warrawina Conservation Park. Um, another reason the Flinders is so famous, of course, is for its tourism. Um, and in particular for its four-wheel drive tracks, some of the best you'll find in Australia. They've been featured on all sorts of um, four-wheel drive websites and, and publications and so on. Uh, the Copper Track is a very famous one where there's some pretty serious off-roading. So uh, the, uh, the station manager there is actually a former graduate of UniSA um, and was very happy for, for us to strap a, a 360 camera to his four-wheel drive and show us what it's all about. So we thought, why not capture that aspect of the Flinders too? and give people a chance to experience that virtually. So you'll see a bit of that as well in, in this video that I'll roll now. Okay, well, that's that's all of our portals. That's all of our um, the scope of the project that we that we hope to encompass by the time it's finished. Um, many of the examples which I've showed you today, um, if you want to explore them further, you can access them via our website, and you can see there projectlive.org.au, and then 360 Flinders Ranges, and that that has the videos that I've shown you already, and also many of the other projects that I've also alluded to, some some teaser galleries and various other things. We will be continuously updating this as we go through with more and more content. And as I said earlier, we will be releasing these portals as they're completed rather than waiting until the end of it's finished. So if you keep checking back, you'll see um, some of these individual portals um, being uploaded accessible to anyone. They are freely available for anyone to check out. So I would encourage you to stay in touch with that. Um, you'll also be able to follow it on social media as well on Twitter and Instagram and so on as well, um, if that's your preference. Um, so yeah, please do stay in touch as this project evolves. Um, the other thing that I'll just plug is um, for those locals here in South Australia, but also um, further afield because uh, Discovery Day this year that's being run by the Geological Survey is virtual as well. Um, I, uh, along with Andrew Cunningham that you can see there and Anthony Reid um, from the survey, um, did a bit of an interview about the Flinders project and a few other augmented and virtual reality initiatives like the Minex CRC project, for example. Um, so that's an interview between the three of us that will be provided as part of Discovery Day this year. So I do encourage you to check that out as well um, if you're keen to learn a little bit more about the behind the scenes of those projects. Otherwise, yeah, that's it from me um, in terms of the project. Thanks for listening. Um, thanks for your enthusiasm and interest in the project. And yeah, I'm more than happy to answer any questions now, I guess, um, or stay in touch with you if you've got any further, uh, further questions or feedback to follow. So yeah, thanks, everyone. thanks very much.